All right. So hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a virtual tour and discussion with Kearsarge Gore Farm on Four Season Farming. And I'm Nikki Kolb, NOFA New Hampshire's Operations Manager. NOFA New Hampshire is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire, and we promote organic farming, gardening, and land care practices for healthy communities. This is the fourth of six tours in our 2020 CRAFT program. And CRAFT stands for Collaborative Regional Alliances for Farmer Training. The program focuses on peer-to-peer farmer-led education and is supported by Farm Credit Northeast Ag Enhancement. And now I'd like to introduce farmers Sam Bauer and Sarah Hansen from Pure Sarge Gore Farm. Welcome guys. Hello everybody. Hi guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, all right, let's take a look around Kearsarge Gore Farm. Gore Farm. I'm Sarah. My name is Sam Bauer and I'll give you a brief history of Kearsarge Gore Farm. Uh, my parents bought the property in 1981 and uh, they started off as loggers. Originally this was one large woodlot. Uh, they cleared land and <laughs> <laughs> uh, they cleared land and um, uh, started pasture raising uh, sheep. Um, eventually they turned the pasture into vegetable gardens um, and today we grow five acres of certified organic vegetables. We raise 20 to 30 sheep, 16 to 18 Devon cows. We raise a couple pigs every year. We cut cordwood in the winter and we make maple syrup in the spring. Our vegetables are all certified organic. We grow basically everything in little quantities. Um, a, the gamut from Market Garden, we don't grow any corn. That's the one thing that people always want that we don't grow. Um, salad mix is a big one for us. Garlic is big for us. We grow about 15 to 16,000 heads of garlic every year, which we just keep going up and up because we love garlic, it's awesome. Um, potatoes, winter squash, and then just an assortment of leafy greens. We always try to experiment with new crops too. We'll do, because we have some smaller beds, we'll try to do things like tomatillos, ground cherries, um, kind of just like play around with things that people ask us to grow. Yeah. We do raise vegetables in high tunnels as well. Uh, we use the high tunnels for season extension. Um, and we often find ourselves, because we farm year round, uh, we often find ourselves transitioning from one season into the other, um, from maple syrup in the spring, uh, and then we're in the sap house boiling and making maple syrup, while at the same time getting into our high tunnels and starting early season salad mixes. Um, then in the fall, uh, we find ourselves selling the storage crops and moving into cutting and selling cordwood and timber off the woodlot. We raise the animals year round. Oh, yeah. um, we raise pasture raised uh, Devon cattle and um, Dorset sheep. Uh, we also raise six to eight pigs a year and um, try to raise a household supply of chickens as well. The animals kind of have a symbiotic relationship with the farm, with the vegetables too. We use a lot of their manure and bedding for compost. So we compile all of that and turn it and process it and spread it out on the garden. So there's kind of an interplay between like the winter bedding and the summer vegetables, which is helpful. We do try and um try and find out where we can be efficient in farming in so many different areas and raising so many different uh, and being involved in so many different aspects of New Hampshire farming. Um, 
and we tried to use the animals to graze and maintain the pastures and the grass around the vegetable gardens. Um, we used the manure from the animals to put back out onto the fields. Uh, we are practicing silvo pasture, uh, which is the practice of grazing cows and sheep in and among the forest and um, from the undergrowth of the forest floor. Mm. We sell our vegetables. We try to sell our vegetables really locally. I'd say, I think like 90% of our vegetables are sold within a 30 mile radius. I think actually maybe 100% of our vegetables are sold within a 30 mile radius. And I'd say probably 90% of the maple syrup in a, is sold within that radius. And 100% of the meat too is sold like really, really locally. We do um, two farmers markets, the Warner Farmers Market and the Concord Farmers Market. We are one of the five members of Local Harvest CSA, a local certified multi-farm cooperative CSA. Sweet Beet Market, the Concord Co-op. We sell some of our maple products um, down on the seacoast. Yeah. We sell at Kittery Trading Post and um, what used to be the Durham Marketplace. And we sell to the Portsmouth Health Food and also Rising Tide Health Food. So that's like the furthest of flung that anything on this property goes is the seacoast and it's the maple syrup out there. Um, but yeah, all the vegetables, we like to stay local and, you know, someday if our road wasn't as bad, we'd have it, all the vegetables just stay on the farm and people would come up and get them, but until we fix the road. When my parents were first selling vegetables, most of the business was out of Concord through the Concord Food Co-op or the Local Harvest CSA. Over the last eight, five or eight years, um, Sarah and I have been involved in the starting of uh, Warner Public Market and uh, have been selling vegetables to the Sweet Beet Market in Bradford as well. Um, and we're excited that we seem to be finding that we can move more and more of our produce um, like kind of hyper locally, right? Within town, within five to 15 miles from the farm. We've been working on our growing practices. So not only we're certified organic here, all of our vegetables are certified organic. Um, we've also been implementing a lot of no-till or low-till gardens, especially the gardens right behind us. We've seen like a huge improvement in soil quality from not running a tractor on them. And that actually really helps because we can get on the gardens a lot earlier in the fall, in the spring um, from May, uh, from like April, March, April, whenever, not March. We can get on the gardens in May, right after the snow thaws. We're in the grounds planting. We have a broad fork. We do a lot of bed prep. Um, and then right now in August, it's been a total drought and the gardens that we use no-till or low-till on are retaining a ton more moisture. We're having to water them less and they're producing the same quality goods as other gardens. It's been kind of a, like a fun experiment to do like the organic plus or kind of think about how else we can help improve the land and how for like for those four seasons what we're doing now is going to impact um, you know, the choices that we're going to make next year or in a couple months, yeah. We do a lot of uh, crop rotation, cover cropping, and the no-till practices, and we've definitely seen over the last four years or so a dramatic improvement in soil health and vegetable quality, for sure. Let's see. I was a graduate of UNH Thompson School. I studied agriculture there for three years. Um, Sarah? I'm an English major. <laughs> it's a perfect match for farming. <laughs> <laughs> yep, my mom was an English major too. My dad was a philosophy major. So, uh, you know, between the four of us, we make it work. <laughs> right at home. <laughs> um, so maybe we will uh, move on and we go from the uh, vegetable season and we do sell vegetables year round, 12 months out of the year through winter farmers markets and off the farm here um, and through the Warner Public Market and Sweet Beet Market. Um, but come fall time, when the uh, garden crops really go to bed, we transition into the cordwood and the logging 
and uh, working the forest around the sugar bush and selecting trees for uh, uh, future use and profits. So maybe we'll go check out some of the logging. found ourselves at the sap house where uh, I'm going to take a minute and talk about our logging and cordwood operation uh, and then maybe Sarah will speak a little bit about the uh, maple syrup operation. Uh, right now it's close to mid-August and I just uh, sold my first two cords of wood of the season. And we are already, before having harvested a single winter squash, are already transitioning into um, cutting and selling wood uh, for firewood and cordwood. The farmhouse is 100% heated on wood. Um, Sarah and I live in a little cabin up the road, which is wood heated. Uh, and we sell anywhere between 10 and 18 cords of wood on any given year. We also use the skitter um, out in our sugar bush where we do a single tree selection. Um, we sell veneer quality oak, uh, we sell pine logs, and we work on uh, releasing young sugar maple trees for possible future uh, uh, tapping potential. Um, soon we will be uh, filling our uh, woodshed here for the evaporator. Our syrup operation is 100% wood fired um, and we require anywhere between 30 and 40 cords of, year, uh, of wood a year uh, to get us through the syrup operation. The logging in the cordwood usually lasts from uh, selling wood uh, beginning in August to really cutting and splitting and going into timber production um, in late Octo uh, October uh, and that will go through until we start our syrup production probably early February. The maple season is something that's special for me here at Curious Sarge Gore Farm because it's how I first came to the farm. I've been here eight years and I started volunteering. I uh, came out from the West Coast to volunteer for a month of making maple syrup in New Hampshire in the winter. I was shocked that people were farming in the winter. Having not experienced like real winter like this before, it was my first time snowshoeing, it was my first time really seeing um, this like abundance of, of sugar maples is not something that is in many other places in the world and particularly where I was from. Um, it was a whole new experience for me. So when I first came here, and it's still how we do it, probably like the first week of February, we're out in the sugar bush, um, snowshoeing, walking, hopefully snowshoeing if there's snow, um, walking around, fixing our lines. We use a lot of plastic tubing in between trees, um, drilling, tapping, um, adding new taps, one to three taps per tree. We make about seven to eight hundred gallons of syrup a year which is awesome so it's all wood fired it's all wood from our land we yeah we boil it all right here it all comes out this door and like i said earlier the we sell 90 percent of it within 30 miles of here um, maple weekend is a huge weekend for us it's awesome we get probably 500 or more people to come up our little dirt road down to our dirt sugar shack and come in to see our evaporator and all this work that we do is such a like a, an awesome time to share this you know i always think about it people doing awesome things in like far-flung corners of our state like you would never end up at this farm if you weren't coming here for a certain thing and um i find that people are always amazed at the amount of work that sugaring takes and I think that it amazes me every year too. I'm not involved in the logging operation at all. And to see um, Sam and his dad and all of our crew that's involved in that is like astounding. After you're like loading this evaporator just like hour after hour for like, we boil not continuously, but for um, 
from February until like the first week of April, we probably have around 20 to 25 days of boiling off and on interspersed based on that like weather change, those um, cool nights and warmer days when the sap starts flowing. Um, yeah, we're just like loading this wood in here and to think that it came from the land here that's, you know, helping to like make more sugar bush essentially. So just like a cool kind of symbiotic thing that happens and it, you know, it happens here. We're not just clear cutting land. We're not doing it. You know, we're not just making maple syrup, like turning an oil burner on. It's kind of this very land based activity that I don't know, it's very unique to New England. It's not all work either. Sometimes it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we, uh, I think that you got it though. That uh, We talked about the logging and... Um, wait, wait, wait. Where does the vacation come in in Four Season Farming? The vacation is tough. Oh, Lord, yeah, Lord. that's right around Christmas. We visit Sarah's parents for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> um, 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 but we spoke about the logging a little bit, um, and Sarah uh, touched on the uh, maple syrup and how we do that in the spring. We spoke earlier about how we transition from uh, one season to the other. Again, we'll be in the sap house making syrup at the same time that we're starting to get into our high tunnels and planting spinach and lettuce and salad mix and things seeding all of our onions too. It's like, okay, if, it's, if we're not in the sap house, we're gonna be, yeah, starting trays and trays of onions and all those early season crops that we get seeded in February. Right, yeah, yeah. a lot of our vegetable production does start in February. Um, really early. Yeah, right along the same time that we're starting the, the maple syrup process. Um, and uh, then the maybe the last thing that we should touch on is the raising of livestock in the animals and that is a year-round project and a daily project um, and this is a great time of year because the sheep and the cows are all out on pasture so we can go take a look at that <laughs> So on uh, Pure Star Tour Farm, we raise uh, Devon cattle, which are a heritage breed of cows. Um, when uh, the United States was first settled, they bred the American milking Devons. Um, they're a tri-purpose cow. They're capable and smart and strong enough to work. Um, we use them and raise them as beef cows. Um, but they are a uh, milking Devon, and so they are capable of being milked as, as well. Um, we call it the fantasy farm. We do a lot of different things on the fantasy farm, um, but uh, someday we would hope to use the cows uh, for all three of those uh, creative and excellent uses. Um, Bob first bought cows maybe when I was eight or ten. We started with just a few acres of uh pasture and just a few cows and now we do anywhere between 15 and 18 acres of hay uh, we rotationally graze on 10 to 20 acres um, and uh, it's it's definitely a year-long project but we enjoy having the animals on the farm and we think that um, if you're doing year-round agriculture in New Hampshire. Um, it's a traditional piece to the agriculture, and to us it's an important piece and a valued piece as well. Another kind of like side benefit to having animals is that they keep some of the other animals that you don't want away. One of our people are surprised when we tell them this, but porcupine is actually one of our biggest predators not deer, not rabbits, not anything else, um, but porcupine and they'll kind of like slink their way in and eat like a little bit of something and then keep going through when you're through the aisle when you're not watching. Um, so we put a porcupine fence and um, well, we put a fence for the sheep and the, so 
subsequent result is that we get to keep the porcupines out. So instead of just like putting up deer fence, we're putting up a fence that is giving us pasture for the sheep and uh, protection from one of our biggest pests. Yeah, also grazing the sheep along the edges of our garden. So it does, it really works out well in two ways, uh, which is the electric fence uh, protects the gardens from predators like deer and porcupine. Um, and also the sheep will manage the edges of our gardens for us um, and keep the weeds and grass down. Uh, we do have to run some like a lawnmower occasionally along the edge of our gardens, but um, it does help us keep our area maintained uh, with less, uh, uh, less machinery and less mechanical intervention. Um, so there are uh, good, useful ways to incorporate your animals in with some of some beneficial garden practices as well. Uh, not just with the compost and the manure, but also just where you put them and where you graze them and, and how you go about setting your fences and your rotation of them. The other part of it is the lambing season in terms of like four, four season farming. In February, Sam's mom is out in the barn with the sheep and the lambs. They're all lambing then. Um, so the coldest nights and then right after that, so we have a barn full of lambs. The trees are getting tapped. We're seeding our, some of our earliest crops. And I think maybe like right there is like the crux of our whole operation, like trying to see that. You know, we're still doing winter farmers markets or the end of the winter farmers yeah. market season, beginning of the. The house is getting heated with wood. <laughs> yeah, so it really does all come together um, at some points in the year, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a year-round operation, and we um, we farm all four seasons, and we find benefit. Uh, not only in like the diversity of our agriculture and the diversity of our markets, um, but I uh, appreciate the diversity of work. It's never the same routine every day. We're not always just doing market vegetables or just raising cows or just cutting wood or just making syrup. We get the benefit in a diverse lifestyle and that helps keeps me sane anyway by the end of the season you're always wanting to do the next thing that's coming along right yeah yeah and the vegetable season i'll and we're excited to pick up the chainsaw and split wood and by the end of wood season we're excited to make maple syrup and by the end of maple syrup we're excited to see the lambs come in and start the vegetables so yeah. um it's it's a lot to keep it all managed but um it's important to us and uh and we enjoy doing it so thank you everybody um and uh um we look forward to uh uh talking and hearing questions thank, thank you guys, guys very much Sarah and Sam, I just unmuted you. Yeah, there you go. Hi, you guys. Hello, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was really fun. It's great to see the farm. Um, so I see that it looks like there are already some questions. Um, but I'm going to start with one that I had planned, and then we'll go into all the questions. So I know that um, you both shared a little bit about your farming backgrounds in the video. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we actually talked about earlier that um, maybe, did you guys want to have any reflections on the video to share before I go into questions? I have a reflection to share. Yeah, I, um, I just want to acknowledge that like, even though you see salmon at my face, like associated with Cure Sarge or Farm, a lot of the time we have so many people 
to thank for the work that we do there. Not only do we have an amazing crew, but Sam's parents are the ones who started the farm. They turned it literally from a wood lot into everything that you see. They built all of the structures. They had like the vision and they are there every single day, like doing work that is incomprehensible to even myself. And I see them doing the work. So um, it's like big shout out. And Sam's sister is here in the audience with our niece, which is so exciting. So yay. <laughs> yeah, just big shout out to like teamwork, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so we are able to share that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'll go back to my first question and then we'll take other questions. Um, so if you two wanted to share anything more about your farming backgrounds before we take additional questions, I welcome you to do that. Um, I, my farming background uh, started on my family's farm and I was lucky enough that and fortunate enough, I mean, my parents never really pushed me into the farming thing. It was always an option for me, and I always had farm chores and things to do, but I don't know. Um, it just kind of came naturally working on the farm. I eventually ended up going to the Thompson School at UNH, where I studied horticulture and forestry, um, and at that time, I worked on the UNH uh, Woodman Farm and the UNH Kingman Farm, which are research farms there. And I got to work with the crew that managed those places, and I learned a lot doing that, and I learned a lot through the Thompson School. Um, I came back home in 2010 and started working full-time after school, and after that, um, you know, there's some reading and there's some conferences and there's visiting some other farms, but I would say most of my education has been driven by Sarah since 2010 and she makes sure to drag me out to other people's operations and um, to, you know, she always brings home the good books and the, she points things out to me and, and so now we're kind of learning together and so that's fun. I didn't have any farming experience before I moved here in any real meaningful sense. I volunteered really briefly at my the organic farm at my college. And, you know, like my grandpa had a garden in his backyard. My parents kept the garden and there's like um, farmers in my history. I've like come to find out more so. Um, like, you know, but I never thought that it like even now I think about it and it's like it doesn't seem like a job that I'm doing like I know that I get paid for it but it doesn't ever seem like I don't know farming doesn't seem like a job that we can do and it amazes me every day when I meet people who are doing this job that it's not like something that happens someplace else yeah so yeah so now basically yeah Sam and I are here and I I've basically learned everything that I know about farming from Pierce Orch Boar Farm or from books or podcasts or movies or NOFA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right. So I'm going to go into our questions from our attendees. So the first one is what are the easiest things to grow and what are the hardest? Good question. Uh, we're still figuring that out. It's funny, every year is so different. Um, we find one year you can have a really excellent uh, booming crop of one thing, and then the next year um, that crop does poorly, but something else does really well. Uh, when you're rotating your vegetables, um, you know, you're, there's benefits to that, but our farm consists of clay loam, sandy loam, and sometimes just like gravelly sand that we try to grow stuff in. And so, you know, uh, planting conditions is a big thing. Um, irrigation is a big thing. Uh, one, one piece that we've been getting more into is the succession planting. Um, so as far as profitability, um, I mean, there's a difference sometimes between profitability and ease, um, but some of these succession crops that you can plant a bed, 
uh, three or four times in a year and harvest radishes and then spinach and then salad greens and then fall carrots out of the same bed. Um, but some, I think that we've been having more luck with our quicker crops kind of as we've gone more towards the no-till raised bed operation. Um, the hard crops to grow would be the ones that our irrigation lines don't reach from the pond. Anything that we're not irrigating, especially this year, very, very difficult to grow. Um, but all of these crops, if they're done right and you are adding the right components and watering on time and paying attention to the weeds, um, they're, they're, they can all be done profitably and, and you know, it's, it's fun to grow beautiful vegetables. So the, that's always the goal anyway. If you want like a super satisfying quick thing to grow, I always recommend red radishes. Just like no problem, super easy, like so satisfying pulling that first one out of the ground. So yeah, and they're super tasty. Yeah. Thank you. All right. The next question is a two part question also. Do you always start all of your seeds outdoors? And when starting new garden areas, what is your favorite way to prepare the new ground? We actually start most of our seedlings. So while Sam is doing a lot of the maple, in, while he's in the sugar house, while Bob is in the sugar house, um, Sam's mom, Jen, is starting a lot of the seeds in, in the basement of the house, actually. Um, I hope somewhat with that I kind of split my time between those two things but we start most of our seedlings um, the first ones that we start are like onions and spinach and even in February just because it takes so long for them to get going and come up to maturity um, I think I can't think of anything that we we still direct seed beets in the garden I know that a lot of people are transplanting beets but I can't think of anything that we don't have at least one tray of started in the house by May yeah so most everything is started indoors yeah the the system that we have that my parents established back from the beginning um, we have a little lean-to style greenhouse off of our basement. Uh, these plants need water and warmth and light to germinate. And so um, we seed our flats and we stack them up next to the wood stove. And we uh, put little plastic coverings on them to keep moisture in for longer. And once they germinate every day, we kind of, when it's cold out and it's still February, then you got to put them out in the lean-to style greenhouse every day to get the light and then take them in every night. It's uh, definitely a labor intensive uh, system that we're using right now. A new seedling and germination high tunnel with some heat in it would be, that would be an improvement for the future. That's I, on the fantasy farm. I guess one thing that, I don't know if we mentioned this in the video, but the whole farm is off grid. So we don't have like a seed, like, I, that's funny that we didn't mention that. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have like a seedling house. Like a lot of people have just like a dedicated tunnel set up with heat and, you know, constant heat and propane and- Electricity. We, electricity, yeah. We could get propane, but we don't have the, yeah, yeah. It would be a, a big, a big leap for us to power our system power a uh, substantial seedling system with uh, like electricity. Thank you. So the next question is, um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that too, <laughs> about being off grid. That's great for everyone to know. Um, so which crops do you use when cover cropping? We use a combination, um, I guess, you know, starting in the fall, um, we're getting ready right now to plant our winter rye. Winter rye is a catch crop over winter. Um, the snow and the rain will leach nutrients out of your soil. 
So you plant your winter rye and that catches the nutrients and turns it into biomass, that tall uh, winter rye grass that you see in the fields. In the spring, um, we'll turn that over or with the permanent raised beds that we don't use the tiller, uh, we'll use a tarp um, and drag the tarp out and heat that down or burn it down with a tarp. Um, and then early in the spring, um, we'll use uh, spring oats, which can germinate in cold weather and take a couple frosts. And again, that's for biomass really. Um, and then throughout the summer, we kind of will use buckwheat in some places, which is a great smother crop and also really excellent for uh, pollinator habitat. Um, and, uh, and in some places we'll use clover, which is a low lying cover crop that fixes nitrogen and builds soil. So uh, those are probably the four main cover crops that we use and each sometimes with a slightly different purpose or timing of the year, depending. Well, one of the questions, there's a part of a question that I think we didn't answer, which was uh, when we're starting new fields or when the farm is starting new fields, what do we, how do we use and prepare those? And I'd say in my time at the farm, we haven't, uh, established many new fields so I can't speak to like when the fields that we're using were first established but we've extended some of the gardens just a little bit um, and it would be a combination of like so mostly it's been like either hay or sod uh, or pasture um, and it'd be a, a, a till with the tractor and then a combination of uh, compost and cover crop to kind of stabilize the soil there um, in combination with planting. Yeah, when you're first starting a garden bed, I mean, even if you're going eventually with the no-till system, um, to prep it first, I mean, you got to get the grass and or whatever's growing out of there. And that, uh, depending on the size area that you're trying to do, um, that's going to require some mechanical cultivation. And sometimes we plow and flip the soil over, um, or sometimes we till, uh, but always we'll have to go back through and pull grass roots and then, yeah, add compost or material and some type of cover, cover cropping um, to kind of, yeah, establish the soil as a good, healthy soil bed opposed to that nasty sod or grass or whatever was growing there. Great, thank you. So the next question is, do you find that you sell out of certain crops quickly and which ones? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, supposed to be a farmer's market customer. Oh my gosh, so sorry. <laughs> yes, we sell out. <laughs> And we, and we can sell out quickly, especially um, this year with the COVID pandemic um, in, in March and April, the, a lot of the supermarkets, their shelves started to run dry. Uh, all the meat was getting snatched up. And we do the CSA model. Um, we started the CSA, uh, Joan, you may know, 18 years ago, I think, maybe we started the local harvest CSA. <laughs> and um, uh, this was the first year that we had to cap the number of uh, people we were allowing to sign up. We, over a one or two week period, we almost doubled the number of CSA shares that we had done last year. Um, and so with higher demand at the CSA, um, and demand at the Warner Public Market and the Sweet Beet Market, and then good turnout at the uh, Concord Farmers Market and the Warner Farmers Market. We're this this year in particular, we are uh, struggling to grow enough. Um, so room for growth for sure. There's a couple. I think when we when we get to try out crops, I think one thing that we mostly sell out of all the time is salad mix. And I think when we get it right, it's a really good mix. And when we don't get it right, we just never have enough of it. Um, one thing that I think I mentioned in the video, we've been for the past two years, we've been growing ground cherries on the customer's recommendation. Uh, the ground cherries has cherries. Um, 
and whenever we bring those to the farmer's market, we always sell out of those. They're like this kind of specialty treat. They grow like a weed, basically, but they're a little bit challenging to pick. And I think maybe the timing for seeding isn't, uh, is a little bit tough, but they're like, I don't know, they just don't taste like they should be growing in New England. So I think some of those like um, non, uh, like more specialty stuff, like the stuff that you're not seeing, like the kale and the Swiss chard, that you know is really tasty and we grow the best but um you know we you know everybody has that so yeah great that's helpful thank you for sharing that um so we have lots of questions which is awesome um, so the next one is can you say more about raising the cows and sheep and the undergrowth of the forest floor? So the, the silvo pasture you were talking about and how do you avoid damage to the forest or are you doing this to begin expanding pasture? That's a good question. Um, and the silvo pasture and the grazing in the forest or on the wood edge there, um, the uh, there are a few advantages of that um one is that uh, a lot of these critters really want a variety of browse and a a varied diet you know and so continuing uh continuing to graze on pasture grasses and clover um over and over again um doesn't give a great variety for um for what they're eating. Uh, the other thing is simply um, the fences, keeping your fences clear. If you're using electric fence um, and grass or brush can grow into your fence, then you lose your electric charge. By running fence in the woods where the sunlight, it doesn't get enough sunlight to grow that uh, brushy, that brushing material or grow grass, you can keep your electric fence clear um, and running better. Uh, more advantages include um, shade, uh, having shade cover for your animals where they can ruminate in the hot part of the day. Um, and we're, we're just kind of, we've always grazed along the edges of our pastures and in the woods here or there. Um, but over time, we're, we've started to do it more intensively, and the idea is using that, selecting that ground specifically for grazing, so we will have a grazing plan. So we're changing that forest floor, much like if you clear cut an area and turn it into a garden, then you're changing that forest. We're going to change by re removing maybe 40 to 50 percent of the trees from those areas will get better grass growth underneath. They'll ha our sheep will have shade, they'll have a variety of browse, and, um, and uh, it will be able to keep our fences clear. So there's multiple advantages to uh, the silvopasture. Awesome. So another question is, do you have an issue with pest management with the dynamic of your farming methods? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, I think I mentioned in the video, porcupine is like the biggest pest and I'm gonna knock on wood because we haven't had any porcupines this year. Um, um, you know, we get, yeah, I think, uh, we do a lot of like mulching in the aisles and I've noticed that with the um, raised beds and no-till that keeping that mulch in the aisle will attract, uh, you know, it leaves a habitat for pests over winter in. So I've definitely seen like more flea beetles, um, cucumber beetles, um, squash bugs, you know, all those sorts of things that uh, you really need because our, our farm is our fields are pretty far apart. You didn't, can really get a good sense of it in the video, but um, we have like a lot of different sections of garden. And so we try to do like a 
crop rotation, but it's also not possible because we're not growing like an acre of this and an acre of this. We're kind of like, it's like one bed right next to each other. Um, so there's inevitably some pest overlap. I think that the thing about farming that's versus like gardening in terms of like pests um, is that we just grow, like farmers just grow more of something. So you kind of like, there's like a pest hurdle and then you have, then you like overcome it and, uh, and you know, you still have a profitable crop to sell afterwards. So yeah, we definitely have pest issues and I haven't solved those problems yet. <laughs> a lot of it, um, you know, we, we always do best, uh, we always do best against the pests when we're managing for them, keeping their habitat as low as possible, um, re removing um, dead plant material or rotting plant material from the gardens, um, cover cropping, or uh, sorry, cover cropping, uh, row covering at the proper times when you know that these pests will be showing up, um, and healthy plants uh, defend themselves from pests. So just doing your best to uh, give that plant what it needs to defend itself. Um, but definitely we, we see all of them, Colorado potato beetle, tomato hornworm, uh, squash bugs, cucumber beetles, uh, tarnished plant bug. We see all sorts of diseases. We get deer sometimes, porcupines pretty bad. And then sometimes the sheep or the cows get out and that can be, that can be tough. So yeah, we deal with a lot of pests. Thank you. And so actually this is another uh, question about the animals. Um, the next question is, do you experience any predator issues with the sheep and cows in the forest? We haven't. Um, um, yeah, knock on wood, uh, as far as with the sheep and the cows, uh, bears definitely will respect um, electric and as far as the fox and the coyote, um, if you've got a nice, sizable, healthy herd of sheep um, with a good, healthy ram, then they, they stay pretty well protected. That being said, we did raise some meat birds for ourselves this year. We raised 30 meat birds just for farm consumption, and the bear got half of them. So we did lose, uh, we did lose some chickens this year. Um, but, uh, um, no, no, we, if, if you keep good electricity around them, then you won't have, uh, uh, many pest problems or predator problems. We also live part, part of the, you know, the farm backs into how many acres is the Rollins State Park, thousands of acres of state park. So I think that maybe unlike other farms that are probably, I'm imagining like boxed in by developments or some sort of like closer, uh like you know closer developments i think that the animals like have a wide range of places to go so they're not like trying to get at our tasty sheep <laughs> <laughs> thanks okay um so the next one is with the very productive four season activities when do you have time to do your recording reflecting planning Etc. for upcoming seasons. <laughs> Funny, you should ask. <laughs> we try to do a lot of that, um, you know, late, in, like the last three weeks of December and January. Um, you know, the days are shorter, so even though well, I go, I go home, I visit my parents for like a month or a month and a half, which I'm very fortunate and lucky to be able to go to and have somebody who is still full-time and running uh, my, you know, primary job. But um, the, yeah, the days are a lot shorter, so we're not out working as long. So we're able to like sit around the kitchen table and kind of figure out those things. A yes. lot of it, a lot of it happens throughout the year too. Um, you know, Sarah keeps uh, keeps scolding us for not writing planting dates on the calendar, days that beds are cleared out. 
Um, the other thing that keeps us vigilant on it is the organic certification. Um, being certified organic, we get recertified every year. And for that, as part of the certification process, we need to be showing our crop rotations, uh, our harvest records, our sales records, um, and uh, you know our compost, we make our own compost, so our compost temperatures. Um, and so the organic certification keeps us pretty diligent on that stuff. And a lot of it happens every day remembering to write things on the calendar and um yeah and we do definitely some cleanup and uh, overall planning in the winter months when we have a little more time outside of the gardens sam always likes to remind me too when i try to like make too many plans or try to be like what is it going to happen it's like january i'm like looking at seed catalogs and being like where are we going to plant this i want this thing here um you know we all we all try to plan it, you know we'll sit and talk with his parents and you know we'll all, all have a different opinion on how something goes and it kind of comes down to the best laid plans just happen when you have the time and energy to do it and also like when the conditions are right we can sit down in may you know and try to plant this field but it's just not ready to be planted like we you know if we didn't get to prepping it or if it's still too wet or the season's too rainy or it's too dry or something you know we can't predict those things so even though we do try to plan to somewhat we definitely do appreciate the wiggle room for uh, creativity <laughs> thank you we have a few more questions and we have seven minutes so we'll try to get to as many as we can um, so this one is, over your personal time working on the maple lines, have you seen a difference in sap production from year to year? And do you think climate change has been an issue? That's a good question. Um, we have seen a dramatic change in, uh, in the sap production uh, for a couple different reasons. Uh, definitely uh, the changing climate is noticeable and an issue. For the maple trees to really be fully productive, they need a temperature fluctuation in a range that is below freezing at night and above freezing in the morning. Um, when those fluctuations become extreme um, and you start experiencing extreme fluctu fluctuations in February or in March, um, that has a dramatic effect on how much sap these trees are actually producing. Um, we have collected more and more sap every year. That's because of advances in technology and equipment. Um, we run a vacuum system now. Um, a lot of the little pieces and bits and tubing and fittings and the way that you boil um, is all becoming more efficient. Um, so the equipment's becoming more efficient, the technology is becoming more efficient, and then nature seems to be working against us in, in the opposite direction. Um, and we're finding that all of a sudden in February or March, it can warm up to 60 degrees for five days in a row. Um, and that's really detrimental, detrimental to the sap production. Um, and sometimes the opposite, you know, and we're experiencing long cold snaps when the sap, uh, snaps when the sap sh should be running. Um, so uh, although we are making more surf every year, that's attributed to uh, better equipment and better management. Um, but we're seeing, if we had continued with just the gravity system, uh, we would really be struggling to make a profitable syrup operation. I'm curious to see what next year's sap season is going to be like with this drought that we had this summer too, because all the sap that flows next year is the rain that fell over this year, or, you know, the snow and the accumulation that happened. So I don't, yeah, let's, let's circle back a year from now and we'll answer that question again. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you. That was a great question. So I'm going to ask you guys the last three questions right now. Uh, so the last three questions are, why do you choose to not grow corn? Do you keep bees for pollination? And do you name the animals? <laughs> I'll take the corn one. Go for it. <laughs> I have, I've only been here for eight years, so I don't know the answer, but my general sense about why we don't grow corn is we just don't have enough land for it. Corn is like a community crop, so you need um, a lot of corn and a lot of wind and a lot of space because they all cross-pollinate with each other, like, you, you know, each kernel needs a uh, pollen from the other corn that's around it to pollinate. Um, and we just don't have the capacity to germinate, grow, irrigate, weed um, that big of an extent of corn. It would be awesome to be able to grow organic corn. I know that there's such a need for it. Um, but we found some good sources for it within our community and then we're happy buying from them for ourselves. Um, so maybe some, someday, you know, when the, when the pond is fuller of irrigation water, we'll get to the corn. Um, the next one was about the bees. Um, for a long time, we do have hives. We have two um, honey bee hives on the property um and uh we get the advantage of the honey and the pollinating we have had problems uh keeping hives over winter over the last couple years uh that didn't used to be such of a problem and now we really are finding that uh, out of the two hives maybe we'll get one to survive a winter um Sometimes we have uh, we have really good luck with the bees. We've had bees, we've had hives uh, make new queens and swarm off, and um, so it's it's not all bad, but it is difficult to keep hives in New Hampshire over winter, um, especially with the problems that they've been facing recently. Uh, but we do do it, and uh, it's. It's good for the pollinating of the vegetable crops. We've never had a problem with that. Um, and it's important to be keeping honeybees. They do, they do so much for us. I think the last question was whether we name the animals, which is an awesome question. Um, Sam's dad names most of his cows. Um, he's had a lot of the cows for over a decade. Um, so, you know, they get, they get special names. We've named cows. He's named cows after people who have come and gone from the farm to volunteers and special friends. Um, I think I had a goat named after me, <laughs> uh, which was exciting for me. <laughs> um, the sheep get names too, mo in, both in love and in agony. I think, you know, we had Jumpy the ram that would never stay in a pen. There was Trit Trot the lamb. Um, so yeah. my, my, my mom who really tends the flock the most, um, she has pet names for almost every breeding you that we keep. <laughs> and oftentimes they're named based on their personalities. Uh, the princess. Yeah, the princess <laughs> or muffle face who has like lots of wool on her face <laughs> and uh, uh, two tags that, you know, instead of calling her number 37, which is what the tag says, she's got two tags. So you call her two tags. Um, yeah. So, so both of my parents are the ones who name the animals on the farm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we, we, yeah. We follow in suit. Yeah, they, we follow. They get to do the name. We support it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for so many thoughtful questions. It was really nice to sit and reflect on, like, yeah, the, I, I felt like I was doing a lot of reflection while I was answering those questions, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I'm going to put up one screen. I know we're at 8 o'clock. Thank you all. Um, one second here. And thank you to Nikki for putting all of this on. You've done a very wonderful job, Nikki. Good, good for you. Thank you, I appreciate it. And we have a great team at Nova New Hampshire that has really helped make all this possible. So thank you to 
Laura as well is on the call and our board members and um, Chad Lee who made this video. Um, but yeah, so I want to just thank everyone again for joining us. This concludes our tour and discussion with CureSource Boar Farm. And I want to thank you, Sarah and Sam, again for a great tour and for answering all our questions and also echoing uh, what Sarah said, thanking everyone for your really thoughtful questions. And I'm glad that we were able to answer them all. Um, and so if you did like this tour, you can support NOFA New Hampshire by becoming a member or making a donation. And I put some links up on the screen. And I also wanted to invite everyone to please mark your calendars for our next virtual craft tour with Hop and Hen Farm on September 30th at 7 p.m. And thank you again for spending your evening with us. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Everybody. Good job. Think Bye. brain thoughts. Go grow something. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>